precious son Even though I was your enemy Praise be with your son Seated me up in the heavenlies I'm in Christ by your grace I sing in praise for all that you done for me Yeah, 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 you dig your love No one loves me, Lord No one loves me like you do Oh, how great is your love And seeking out this lost and wicked sinner When I was dead in sin You gave me life, love and happiness I'm redeemed Justified, sanctified, soon to be glorified, yeah Yeah, yeah, I dig your love No one loves me, Lord, no one loves me like you Oh, love me, Lord, no one loves me like you too I dig your love I dig your love, Lord All right, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1? 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. You should have, my, uh, you should have your translation, whatever that is, open to that verse, and, as well as my translation of 1 John. And uh, we're going to uh, wrap up our study of the prologue, the first four verses of 1 John. And a uh, very important uh, section because it basically is presenting to us the foundation of our fellowship with God. In fact, our relation, eternal relationship with God as well, namely the person of Jesus Christ. So uh, we're going to uh, note this evening in verse 4, uh, we're going to be noting that adherence to John's apostolic testimony will cause the eyewitnesses uh, like John to experience joy to the maximum. So we're going to be looking at that. Uh, there's an author-centered purpose, as we pointed out, as well as an audience-centered purpose. And uh, we're looking at, in the, uh, we saw the, um, the audience-centered purpose uh, in verse 3 last week. And then we're going to look at verse 4 tonight and see the uh, author-centered purpose. So, so we're going to be talking about joy, and in particular, pastoral joy, we call it. The joy of a pastor. And of course, this is uh, not uh, the same as John's uh, personal happiness. 
and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, the pastor's joy in relation to his gift, the function of his gift and the people in his congregation. So with that uh, being said, let's take a moment of silent prayers as our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. The confession of sin is absolutely essential if we're going to have fellowship with God. It restores us to fellowship with God based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And of course, we maintain that fellowship by obeying the word of God and the spirit who has inspired the scriptures speaks to us through the communication of the word of God and so when we are obeying his voice uh, doing, doing what he tells us to do uh, we're filled with the spirit commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18 and we're also simultaneously letting the word of Christ literally dwell in our soul so if there's anything that's bothering you disturbing or distracting to you do what 1 Peter 5.7 says cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you so with our heads bowed and our eyes closed let us pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We know that, thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for this study in 1 John. And we pray that you would bless us this, in this study of 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 here this evening. We pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to each person individually and as a, a local, uh, as a corporate unit. Not only those in the Thompson home, but those who might be viewing this class or listening to it live through the website or at a later date through the recordings on the website. And we just pray, Father, that you would uh, help them to, by the power of the Spirit, those in the audience, to understand what's being taught, to make application, to concentrate. And please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. We pray that you would empower me to communicate your full counsel to your people with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power so that this could take place. Help me to be humble and sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction as well. And also we pray that you would help shine in uh, with the sound of the recordings, the video, the audio, we thank you, Father, for the wisdom you've given her, and uh, we just pray, Father, thank you for her stepping in in place of her dad while he's uh, on a trip, and we pray for his safe return to us uh, tomorrow evening, Father. So, Father, we pray for this service, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, if you could look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, I'm going to read from the Net Bible, uh, and then I, what I'll do is I'll read from the ESV, and then today's NIV, so there's a, there are several different approaches to translation, dynamic equivalents, formal equivalents. And the Net Bible uh, basically it affirms that they do use both of, uh, both of those approaches. And uh, it says in 1 John 1.1 1, 1 in the Net Bible, it says, This is what we proclaim to you, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and our hands have touched, concerning the word of life. And the life was revealed, and we have seen and testify and announced to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you too so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So there's the vertical aspect of Christian fellowship there, and uh, we see that uh, there's the authored -centered perp uh, the uh, audience-centered purpose there in verse 3. John is writing these things so to ensure the maintenance of their, the audience's fellowship uh, with the Father and the Son, and thus the Spirit. Remember, these people who are, John was writing to were in the Roman province of Asia in the final, probably the final decade of the first century AD. Uh, John was more than likely writing from Ephesus, as we saw in our introduction, and we know this from church history more than we do from the scriptures. And uh, we see that these uh, Christians in the Roman province of Asia, the people who received this particular letter, uh, it was a circular letter because it doesn't have the usual uh, components of a, a first century Koine letter that we see in Paul's epistles. And this uh, indicates that it was, uh, uh, it was uh, designed to be sent to uh, several churches. It wasn't just addressed to one particular church. It was addressed to all the churches in the Roman province of Asia. So initially, more than likely, you see the, first, you see the seven churches of Asia mentioned in uh, Revelations chapters 2 and 3. They were probably the people that initially got it. And then, of course, they made copies of these things and they sent them off to the other churches, so like Colossae and Laodicea. So we, uh, we see that John's trying to, uh, these people were saved, they were born again and saved, they were already remaining faithful 
to John's apostolic teaching that he affirms in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. And actually those verses, as we'll see when we get to them, serve as a commendation for the audience that they had not uh, fallen victim to the, the uh, protonostic teaching in the Roman province of Asia. And they had uh, therefore remained faithful to John's apostolic teaching. So what he's basically doing in this epistle is trying to uh, maintain their fellowship and protect it and uh, educate them on the false doctrine, which we noted uh, there were Gnostics uh, who were, uh, they, they, it was a proto-Gnosticism or an incipient form of Gnosticism. Oh, an, another word for incipient, you could have to you could break it out and say it's a form of Gnosticism that was in its infancy. It didn't, I say infancy because it didn't become a full-blown, it wasn't fully developed as a threat against Christianity until the midway point of the second century AD. So John and Paul saw this in Colossians, as we saw in our Sunday classes. He saw this uh, uh, Gnosticism that was starting to emerge in the Roman Empire and it was a threat to Christianity because uh, they basically would take Christian uh, the Apostles teaching distort it take things out of context and they would mix it with uh, Greek philosophy and whatnot and the mystery uh, the doctrine of the mystery religions of the ancient world and they basically said that salvation the main the way to get saved was uh, through um, uh, uh, knowledge and they also had another heresy uh, they had also said that uh, Evil originates from God. And of course, the Bible teaches otherwise. The Bible teaches, the apostolic teaching teaches, is that mankind and Satan, the angels, are the pro responsible for sin coming into the world. And when we get to 1 John 1, 5 tomorrow evening, we know what sin is, words and actions that are sinful, thoughts that are sinful, by comparing it to God's holy standards, who God is. We'd never know what sin is unless God revealed to us his holy character and how our actions don't measure up to his. So this is what we got going on. And then uh, we get to verse 4 here in the prologue. John now turns to uh, a uh, author-centered purpose here. Uh, he, want, he and his uh, fellow eyewitnesses, disciples of Jesus Christ, who are eyewitnesses to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, they want to be, continue to experience joy to the maximum, and they will do so if the recipients of this epistle adhere to the teaching in this epistle. So then he says in verse 4, Thus we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Let me read those exact same verses in the ESV. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And then it says in the today's NIV, which is a dynamic equivalence translation, uh, not a, a formal equivalence approach like the New American Standard and the ESV. Basically, they're not trying to uh, strictly hold to uh, word order when they translate things. Uh, and uh, they're trying to uh, get many times the uh, idea of the, uh, the sense of the original language rather than trying to stick strictly to um, uh, uh, in a literal fashion. So uh, both approaches you need to use when you translate the Bible or any language really for that matter. So it says in First uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 in today's NIV, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which you have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared and we've seen it and have testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And, uh, so, and then uh, lastly, the, uh, with, I'll read from the New American Standard those verses, because the New American Standard we use uh, for our, uh, our, as I study Bible here, eventually it's going to be turned over to the ESV, which is a little bit uh, more modern translation that takes a formal equivalence approach. And it's better to use the formal equivalence approach, I think, when you, do it, when you study in Bible class, if you have to go back to the original languages, so it's a, it's a little bit easier to do than, say, with the NIV. But it says in the New American Standard in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be complete. So I give you those different translations because I want you to take advantage. I'm trying to teach you guys that the translations, the English translations, are very good, excellent scholarship behind every single one of them. ESV, today's NIV, uh, the New American Standard, whatever you want, Net Bible, great scholars have worked on it, so don't be afraid to read your translations. Why do I go back to the original language and have my own translation? Because that's what I should be doing. Because that's my, I'm your pa pastor, and you're listening to my interpretation as your pastor, so my translation would reflect my interpretation, which is not far off from uh, the translations that you have. And uh, mine is probably more of an expanded paraphrase many times because I'm trying to bring out the various nuances of the tenses and whatnot or the first class condition in the original text, something that the, reg the, uh, the translations are not going to do because they're going to leave that open for your pastor or the interpreter do, to do. So, uh, so you're not, the you're, you're, way I look at things, the better, uh, the more um, I can benefit from the scholarship that's out there. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I like to take advantage of it. I'm all, and I always try to get the, uh, do the, uh, you want to be the best you want to be at something, whether it's a pastor or just the Christian growing, try to take advantage of all these wonderful things that we have today, with all, especially the translations. Whereas 300 years ago, when we studied, excuse me, the, <coughs> the history of the Bible, <coughs> there it was, excuse me, the, uh, the history of the Bible, you know, 300 years ago, you had just the King James. You know, or, you know, Tyndale's or whatever, which is King James kind of built, uh, built off the Tyndale's translation. But, you know, basically, uh, we, we take these things for granted in our country. We have so many great uh, uh, Bible programs now. Even lay people can go back and look at the original language. In fact, there's, if you really want to learn Greek and Hebrew in the new, in the, uh, of the Bible, you got stuff free online that you could learn how to learn Hebrew and Greek. So it's, uh, and this, it's, very, it's exciting times that we're living in. And the, and the irony of the whole thing is, is uh, uh, especially in America, a lot of Christians they just don't, they're just not caring about this stuff. And you would think that they, and I say that because, here's the reason why I tell you that, because the, the church, and you've heard me say this before, the churches that are getting packed out are the churches that are into the dog and pony show and emphasizing entertainment and, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, and, not, and, and not the full counsel of God, not teaching all the different books of the Bible and the great doctrines of the Christian faith. And they emphasize music and whatnot. And uh, nothing wrong with music. Music should be used as a teaching aid, as we saw in Colossians 3.16. So that's how we try to use it here. But you, you get your people that are not taking advantage of these things, the majority of Christians in our country today, which is very, very sad. And so uh, uh, always remember, to whom much is given, much is required. So the way I look at it, things, I have a lot of great blessings given to me living in this time of history and you know, benefiting from all the scholarship for centuries in the church and uh, in Israel, and I'd be a fool not to take advantage of these things. So I'm very, I feel very blessed to be living in this time. So verse 4, as we're going to see, is talking about the, the uh, authored-centered purpose of this epistle. John is teaching in this verse that adherence to the apostolic testimony will cause the eyewitnesses to experience joy to the maximum. Apostolic testimony, meaning the, the teaching of the apostles and their eyewitness testimony, about Jesus Christ, that he was both God and man. He did die on the cross. He did rise from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. He did ascend into heaven and see at the right hand of the Father. And so they're eyewitnesses to these things. And so he's passing this information along. The apostles did that in the New Testament documents. And when he talks, we talk about eyewitnesses. John was an eyewitness to Jesus. The, all the apostles of the world were, and disciples like Mary Magdalene and whatnot, and they were all were involved and being eyewitnesses to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. What does hypostatic union mean? We've studied it many times in the past. You should know it here. It's basically, don't, don't be, uh, you know, I, I, I refuse to allow my, my congregation to say they can't learn a, a difficult, a, a big term. Uh, you know, I'm not going to indate you with that, but if the hypostatic union is something that you should all know. Hypostatic means that Jesus Christ in his person is, is, is united in himself uh, a deity and a human nature. 
Uh, he is 100% deity, 100% humanity. The, uh, the integrity of his attributes are not diminished, of his divine attributes are not diminished because he's a human being, and vice versa. The, the integrity of the attributes of his human nature are not diminished or, uh, uh, in any way so that he, is both, he could be, he truly be uh, both God and man. And that's what hypostatic union means, the union of two natures. So when you think of hypostatic union, think of a, a nature or essence. It's actually, found, it's actually a biblical word found in Hebrews chapter 1. So these terms help us, theologians have come up with these terms over the years to help us understand the person of Christ. That's why Trinity is a word, another word, or rapture, all these different terms, redemption, reconciliation. Now, these are all terms, justification, these are all terms that are big terms in the Christian faith that we should rem remember what these are. So uh, when I use the term hypostatic union, a, synony a synonymous expression would be the God-man. I'll say that. Most often not, you'll find me, depending on the audience, uh, uh, in front of me using the term God-man. Uh, but I always have to qualify that because I don't ever know who's listening. So verse 4, we're going to talk about joy here. And uh, something like the uh, Philippian epistle was all about joy. And uh, we need to be, one of the things that ruins our testimony is a lack of joy in our lives. We want to talk about uh, people uh, knowing that we're a Christian, and that's a great thing. But this is how we, we, you know, uh, we do it. It's, uh, it's not necessarily uh, putting on a bumper sticker or something like that. And uh, I, was, I was talking to uh, Cheyenne before class. We were talking about she has a really nice, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, what is it called? Necklace. She had a really nice necklace and uh, things that, and uh, earrings that has a cross. And that's, that's great. That's basically you know, uh, her way of saying, hey, I'm a Christian. And we were talking about, uh, you know, that even more than that is the way you are and, tr and you are, conduct your life. That is telling everybody uh, that you're a Christian. And just think about this. Like, for instance, um, when I deal with people, you know, whether it's in my apartment complex or at Starbucks or in the church or in the name, wherever I go, or my family, um, I'm very conscious about now, uh, very, very conscious about the way I behave and where I, my priorities are, the way I treat people, the way I talk to people. Um, all of that is telling people something about me, all right? How I handle adversity, tough times, you know, and, uh, and that people are watching. So it's my character is, which is everything. So just think about this. If my words, I can sit there and talk a good game, but if, I, if my actions and my priorities and my character, the way I talk, the way I treat people, are not uh, measuring up or corresponding to what I profess, what good is that? Because people see that. You know, so uh, we have to be very careful that we're consistent that what we profess to be and want to show people is, is also going to be the way we are acting, it's reflecting in the way our character is as well. It corresponds to our godly character. So that hurts a lot of, te a lot of, pa it's even happened, uh, it happens to pastors because we're sinners too. You could sit there and, you know, be a great, sound in your doctrine, but if you, you have, you conduct your life badly and you're involved in your living an ungodly lifestyle you've just hurt your testimony so we don't want to do that so we have to work we have to we used to call it walk in the talk in fact i was in uh, I, uh there's a song i was writing i haven't finished it off but called walk the talk and uh, basically in sports they say well you know let's you talk you used to play you used to have trash talk and you know we play on the basketball court say i can hit this shot over you blah, blah. we call it trash talk and whatnot. it's in every sport and basically you can say you're going to do this to the guy but if you don't do it and you don't back up what you say oh, i'm going to hit this three-pointer from down here and you don't do it, it you, eventually no one's going to take you seriously they're going to laugh at you you're going to make it look you're going to look like a fool so if you're going to say you're going to do something you better do it and you better say, hey, I'm going to do this. Because then that, uh, that, that gets the, the other guy's respect. And that's what you want. So verse 4 here, 1 John 1, 4, presents a purpose, which is the direct result of the previous one recorded in verse 3, as we pointed out. And that one in verse 3 presents the overall purpose of the epistle. John wants to protect the fellowship and maintain the fellowship of his readers with the Trinity. Now, when he says we write, the couple of words in the original grapho is the word for, uh, grapho is the word for write, we write, uh, uh, we, uh, excuse me, write, and then the word for we is the personal pronoun ego. Now, it's interesting, um, we see that uh, he could have, uh, like uh, with Greek, the Greek language, unlike English, 
Greek is an inflectional language. What I mean by that is, in the word grapho, you could construct the word, form the word, so that the subject is already in the word. So you could say, I write, and the I is already in the verb. Whereas, uh, in English, we have to go, I write, two words. But in Greek, you could make it one. Now, when the writer makes it two words to say what he could with one word, that's for emphasis, and that's what he's doing with this word ego. He, he, uh, and he's emphasizing that he and his fellow eyewitnesses of the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ are communicating this information uh, to the readers, the recipients of this epistle. The personal pronoun ego means we, of course, it's used in a distributive sense, emphasizing no exceptions, and it's referring, of course, to John and his fellow eyewitnesses to the historicity of the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ emphasizing a contrast between them and the recipients of the epistle. So when the writer does this with this personal pronoun ego, which he, could, he, he, he doesn't necessarily have to use the word, but when he does, it's usually for emphasis or both. It could do both. It could emphasize a contrast. And the contrast here is between John and the recipients of this epistle. Or in other words, John and his fellow eyewitnesses and the recipients of this epistle. And of course... Uh, when I say historicity, it's basically saying that the fact that Jesus Christ was both God and man is an historical fact. How do we know that? We have eyewitnesses to this. It's just like anything else in life. Um, uh, our, our, uh, you know, when people say, oh, John Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, or Abraham Lincoln was in 1863, or George Washington lived in the, in the 1700s, how do you know this? Because people were there. They knew these people. They were eyewitnesses to these events. Pearl Harbor or the Kennedy assassinations or uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the World War I or Civil War, assassination of Lincoln, assassination of Gaius Julius Caesar, uh, uh, Alexander the Great. People were eyewitnesses and they wrote down what they saw. And it's no different from the biblical, uh, uh, the, uh, what they said about uh, what they, the eyewitness testimony about Jesus Christ. So John's saying, we were eyewitnesses to this. And the reason why he's doing this again, remember, because there were people who were false teachers who were saying Jesus was not a human being. And they were part of a, a Gnostic uh, a way of thinking about Jesus. And that's not true. John said he was a human being. He is God. I'm, me and many others are eyewitnesses to this fact. So we were there. These guys were not. These people were saying that he wasn't a human being. They weren't. We were. Who you want to listen to? The people who were there or the people who were not there? who got, got second-hand information and false information. So the word graphone here refers to the act of communicating and writing to the recipients of this epistle various subjects which pertain to the Christian way of life. Now when he says these things, it's, uh, the word, uh, it's two, one word in the Greek, it's the demonstrative pronoun hutos, and this refers to information provided by John in the three preceding verses. And it's used in a distributive sense, emphasizing no exceptions, indicating that each of these verses, each of these things, are of critical importance to the recipients of this epistle. So when you say these things, you could actually say each and every one of these things I wrote to you in verses 1 through 3 are very, very important. Now, when he says, so that our joy may be complete, that again is the purpose uh, for which John and his fellow eyewitnesses communicated in writing to the recipients of this epistle the information which appears in verses 1 through 3. So there's the, that right there is what we call the authored-centered purpose, meaning the author, by writing these things, the author, the people, and John and his fellow eyewitnesses, the purpose of writing these things to the recipients of this epistle is so that they might receive joy. And in verse 3, it's, we have the, the, uh, the uh, audience-centered purpose where the recipients of this letter, the purpose for this, this, the contents of the prologue, were to ensure the fact that the recipients of this epistle continue to have fellowship with the Father and the Son. Now, when he says, our joy, the word for joy is the word hara, uh, hara and this word is, uh, refers to the Apostle John and his fellow eyewitnesses to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, experiencing joy. It would be produced in them by the Holy Spirit as the result of hearing of the recipients of this letter, adhering to and conducting their lives by means of their testimony concerning the person of Jesus Christ. So this word hara, it contains the joy, it contains the figure of uh, speech called metonymy, 
which is found in all different uh, languages, including the biblical languages. And there's various types of metonymy. This is what we call metonymy of the effect. And that simply means that the recipients of the letter conducting their lives by means of this testimony is a cause for joy for John and his fellow eyewitnesses. So here, we have the effect for the person producing it. Thus, the recipients of this letter will produce joy in the lives of John and his fellow eyewitnesses because the readers will, were obeying this teaching concerning the person of Jesus Christ. And then we have an idiom in the Greek. The, the phrase may be complete uh, in the, uh, in, let's say, the Net Bible. What, the, what do they have as uh, the translation for that? Uh, they, yeah, may be complete. Pretty much every ESV is the same, is the same deal, I believe. Where's my verse four for that? Yeah, uh, maybe complete. So they're all they're all in the in the in the same thing. Translation, good translation. I would translate it uh, 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 a little bit differently, as we'll say. I would say uh, to cause our joy to exist in a maximum state. That's what he's basically the idea here, and I'll show you why I say that. First of all, the, the phrase may be in the it's translating the Greek verb ame. Here it means to exist in a particular state or condition, and the verb uh, pleuroo. Uh, this word means, uh, it's translated may complete. I say you should translate it maximum because it's actually a Greek idiom when it's used with this word for joy, hara. And that is, it speaks of a, uh, a joy that's filled to the brim and continues to stay full to the point of overflowing. So therefore, this would denote the joy of the recipients of John and his fellow eyewitnesses existing in a maximum state as a result of the recipients of this epistle adhering to their teaching in verses 1 through 3. Now this word, in the Greek, it's, a, it's called a paraphrastic participle. And it's used with this verb, eimi, to form a finite verbal idea, which is an intensive, perfect, paraphrastic participle construction, for those who are interested that, uh, that uh, listen. But what you need to know, and the, the reader, is it, it's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a, a construction for emphasis. And it emphasizes a present state in particular, this particular construction. It emphasizes a present state of joy being experienced by John and his fellow high eyewitnesses to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ as a result of a past action of the recipients of this epistle adhering to verses 1 through 3 of John's teaching here in the prologue. So, with that out of the way, let's look at verse 1 of my translation, please. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. And the reason why I, I, you, you probably say, well, if you're new, new listening to me, you should know this already, been following me for any period of time. If I do go back to the original language, it's only because if I'm going to, my translation or my interpretation is going to bring out something that you don't see in your translation, okay? I'm going to explain why. So I could sit there and go, okay, this is what it is, and I'd be like the Pope, and whatever I, de you know, is decreed, that's what it says. But I don't like to do that. I like to explain why I, I, I say what I say and what I teach. And I like to support it with facts. So if I, that's why I, I'm not trying to teach a Greek or Hebrew class. I'm just trying to tell you, hey, this is what it says. And so you know that I'm going back there. And if you wanted to check it out, it's all going to be documented on a PDF document eventually anyways. And you could check it out for yourself. If you want to learn Greek or Hebrew, you can do that. You can check out my grammar. Or you can take it to somebody else, a scholar. You can check it out and see if, if this is true or not. So... Um, that's what I want to, I, I want to uh, support, explain what I teach. I don't want to just sit there and go, you know, this is what it is and, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, so look at verse John 1.1. 1, 1. We're now proclaiming to each of you what has always existed from eternity past, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we observe for ourselves, even what we touched with our hands concerning the word, which is truly life. In other words, this life was revealed. As noted previously, we've seen, so therefore we're now proclaiming by testifying to each of you this life, which is eternal, which because of its eternal nature has always existed face to face with the Father. Indeed, it was revealed to each one of us. What we have seen, as well as heard, we are now proclaiming to each of you in order that each of you would also continue to regularly experience fellowship with each of us. Also, our fellowship is in fact as an eternal spiritual truth, existing in the state of being with the Father as well as with his Son, who is Jesus, who is the Christ. So you can see that, as we pointed out last week, the, the, uh, the origin of John's fellowship and his, his fellow eyewitnesses with the Father and the Son is divine in origin, this fellowship. It's Christian fellowship. Then verse 4, Thus, 
we ourselves are now communicating in writing concerning each of these things in order to cause our joy to exist in a maximum state. So we have in verse 4, John's presenting a purpose, another purpose for his writing, which is the direct result of the one he presented at the end of verse 3. In the latter, verse 3, as we just read, John expresses his spirit-inspired desire that the recipients of this epistle would continue to regularly experience fellowship with himself and the other surviving disciples of Jesus Christ and those who adhere to his apostolic teaching concerning the person of Christ. So when he talks about we, he's talking about his fellow eyewitnesses. We were there. We saw Jesus. We both, both, that he's both God and man. We can testify to this. Then John, as we just read in verse 4, uh, verse 3, emphatically asserts that this fellowship is also with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Thus, John is telling the recipients of this epistle, the Christians in the Roman province of Asia, that this fellowship that he was experiencing with the other eyewitnesses was divine in origin. Now, here we get in verse 4, in verse 4, we find John expresses another spirit-inspired desire. This time, this one asserts that his joy and the joy of his fellow eyewitnesses would continue to exist in a maximum state as a result of the recipients of this letter adhering to their testimony in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So therefore, verse 4 presents the second purpose which John is writing to the recipients of this epistle, and it's the direct result of the first purpose, recorded in verse 3. So, as we noted in our study of verses 2 and 3, the purpose for which John was writing this epistle is actually, you could say, fourfold. And it's reflected by several statements in this epistle. We've looked at these in the past. I'm just going to review them quickly. But the first of these contains the overall purpose for this epistle. Uh, when he says, these things we write in verse 4, that points back to his statements in verse 3. And these things we write in 1 John 2, 1, points back to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. These things I have written in 1 John 2, 26, points back to his statements in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. And then the phrase, these things I have written in verse 1 John 5, 13, points back to his statements in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. So as we saw in the past, therefore the, first, the fourfold purpose of 1 John is first and foremost to, to, well, I shouldn't say foremost, it's to secure the joy of the believers he's writing to and, and, and uh, secure, secure his joy. Secondly, this epistle is to assure the, these believers that they have a provision for sin when they do sin, and thus eternal security. Thirdly, John wanted to protect his readers from false doctrine by encouraging them to continue in the doctrine he taught them. And lastly, Paul wanted to reassure his readers that they possess eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. However, John's overall purpose is found in the, in the prologue, in that John wants his readers to continue to obey his apostolic message concerning the person of Christ so as to protect their fellowship with God which would bring him joy. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. Why is this so important? This, these four verses in the prologue are the found, basically presenting the foundation of the Christian way of life. It's, it's presenting the foundation of Christianity. Who's that? What is that? It's Jesus Christ. It's very important because his death and resurrection is meaningless if he's not God and man. His death is meaningless, but because he's, per he's God and therefore perfect, the Father accepted his sacrifice on the cross as the payment of our, for our sins and, reconcil and thus reconciling us to a holy God, us sinners, through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So if the, if, if the readers, if the John's uh, readers who are Christians turn around and say, they start listening to this false doctrine about Jesus and that he's not a human being, then they're not going to have fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit because fellowship is based upon the fact that Jesus is both God and man. There would be no relationship with the Holy God for us sinners if God the Son doesn't become a human being and be the mediator between a holy God and sinners. 1 John 2, 5. So uh, it, this is very important. The only way we, we're going to live, and the only reason why we have an eternal relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and have fellowship and, communi and can commune with the, the Trinity is because God the Son became a human being. And, and when he became a human being, that was critical that he became a human being because deity doesn't, can't die a, a, a physical and spiritual death on the cross. God, only a, a human being could. 
If God the Son become a human being, then he could suffer physical death. Then he could be abandoned by his Father on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and then he could receive a resurrection body on the third day. And here's the other thing. He's by God the Son becoming a human being, he restored uh, human beings to the place that God had originally designed them to be, ruling over the works of God's hands. That's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, Genesis 126, you know, God said to Adam and Eve, who were both created in the image of God, and uh, with uh, Adam being the head, and she was the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the helpmate, she was subordinate to him, and though she was subordinate to him, she was not inferior to him, because they were both created in the image of God. She was only subordinate to him because of functionality, just like the Father, the Son and the Spirit are subordinate to the Father. They're not inferior to the Father, but for function, the way the Trinity functions with authority in, this, in the Trinity and subordination, that's how be, uh, human be, uh, uh, Adam and Eve were designed to function. So uh, we see when they fell and they sinned in the Garden of Eden, now Satan usurped the authority of Adam and Eve, and he became the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And so that's why he could say to, to uh, Jesus in, 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 the, uh, in the Gospels, I'll give you, I can give you all these things. Yeah, he, could, he, he temporarily was given uh, rulership over the earth. That's why he's called the God of this world. And so God's, not, God's uh, original purpose was not for that to be, take place, but he anticipated it. And so he sent his son to become a human being. And then when he died on the cross in obedience to the Father's will, and he was raised from the dead, and then see at the right hand of the Father, now he sits at the right hand, sovereign over creation, over the... Uh, every creature, every human being, every angel, and he's going to establish, Jesus is going to establish his millennial kingdom on the earth at his second advent. We studied that in Daniel and Zephaniah. And he was going to establish his second advent. And then with the church, his bride, he will rule over the works of God's hand, a human being who's also God. And that's what God is in the process of doing for us. So we see here that that's very important that they were straight about Jesus Christ. Now I want to throw this, this in. And this is very important. Is it possible for a Christian, or someone who's been justified through faith in Jesus Christ, who believes that Jesus is both God and man, is it possible for a Christian to be deceived and think that Jesus is not God, a human being anymore? Yes. Yes. Are they still saved? Yes. Will they be under discipline? Yes. Why would John warn his, writer, his readers about these things if it wasn't possible for a believer justified by faith in Christ to fall into false doctrine and not believe that Jesus is both God and man anymore? It's possible. So we see here that, uh, uh, and that so they, therefore, therefore be, there'll be discipline if they don't conf uh, confess that sin and get back into following what the apostles taught, which is in our New Testament. So in these verses, and the first four verses, there's an author-centered purpose, as we pointed out, meaning that John sought to benefit by his readers continuing to obey his apostolic teaching. And there is also, of course, an audience-centered purpose, meaning that John sought for his readers to benefit from fellowship with God. Now, uh, you know, we might be thinking that uh, with... The, uh, with um, what John's saying here, you know, I tell you that John wants to, uh, uh, he wants to have joy here uh, by his readers, you know, it's adhering to his apostolic teaching. So there's an audience-centered, uh, there's an audience-centered purpose here. I want to get a quote here from Warren Worsby. But that's not selfishness. Uh, you might be saying to yourself, isn't that kind of selfish of John to be, uh, you know, doing that? And, uh, and of course, it's not the case. It's not, uh, it's not, um, it's not the case, and I want to get that joy here. Yeah, I think it was Constable that wrote it. I'm not sure. Hold on one sec. Let me just find it here. Oh, that was good. Well, I can't, I can't find it. I don't know where the quote is. Oh, well. So anyways, John's not being selfish. He's actually, by because at the, at the heart of his joy is that his, his readers, the recipients of this epistle, would actually uh, be, uh, be staying in fellowship with God. So John's not being, uh, being selfish by saying he wants to have joy to the maximum, 
but it, because his joy is based upon them continuing to have fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he's not being selfish at all. His joy as a pastor is derived from his, 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 uh, his congregation uh, benefiting from his teaching. And this is what every pastor wants to do. He'd love to have everybody in his congregation adhering to his teaching. Of course, it doesn't always work out. In fact, you might have many times you have people who are Christians sitting in your congregation who will reject your teaching out, outright. Uh, many times they do it because there's sin in their lives and they're convicted and they don't want to change things. And so therefore it's easier and then it's easier to retaliate against the pastor by leaving or you know, going after him and criticizing him because you don't like what's being said. And it's actually, if he's, doing, if he's teaching what the scriptures say, your, your beef is not with your pastor, it's with God. So uh, that's why pastors can't, can't you, you got to really fight, not take it personal, but it's hard not to take it personal. And, you know, because when you sink your, your, your heart, soul, and mind, and body, and, and sacrifice to, for your, your congregation, yeah, it's, you're going to take it personal. You are going to be hurt. And, you know, every pastor would love to see his people in his congregation obeying the word of God and teach, and, and that he's teaching and, and seeing them continue to grow up spiritually. Nothing gives a pastor as, as much joy. And, of course, it, it's kind of like, you know, I'm a spiritual father as a pastor. Parents know this, and I've seen parents through the years who have raised their kids and, 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 and according to the word of God, brought them to church and everything, and they turn out, they just run off, and they... They reject Jesus altogether in the Bible, and they don't go to a church anymore, and then they end up marrying unbelievers, and it, like, you can see the heartbreak in the parents. And, of course, God, who's the greatest, the father who's the greatest parent, he suffers too when he sees his creatures, his, ch uh, his people he created in his image, rejecting him and his son, Jesus Christ. So, as a pastor, and as a pa parents understand this, when, they, when the children's, when children go... Uh, uh, in the wrong direction, and pastors see this when their, their members of their congregation go in the wrong direction, we can identify, therefore, with God. And so what nothing gives a pastor as, as great, just like a parent, it doesn't give, nothing makes a parent more, um, more happier than to see their kids, you know, becoming the, 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 pe the people that they had trained them to be and, uh, and, uh, and raised them to be. And same thing with a pastor. Nothing gives a pastor greater joy than to see the, the, the people in his congregation who he's serving with, by teaching them the word of God and praying for them, um, adhering to the teaching and growing up to maturity and enjoying their relationship with God. So here in verses 1 through 4 of 1 John, we have two interrelated purposes, the audience-centered purpose and we have the author-centered purpose. And here in verse 4, we have the author-centered purpose. The joy mentioned by John in 1 John 1, 4 refers to he and his fellow eyewitnesses continuing to experience joy to the maximum as a result of hearing of the recipients of their letter adhering to their testimony. This joy, as, we, as I like to call it, is pastoral. Uh, you hear the word pastor, the word pastoral means it's re this joy is related to being a pastor. It's not speaking of John's personal happiness. So what I'm telling you is, John has a happiness is twofold. And this is true of every pastor. There's a personal happiness that has nothing to do with the response of your congregation to your teaching. And then there's a, there's a joy that's related to the response of the congregation to your teaching. John's speaking of the latter here in verse 4. So John's happiness is twofold. There's a personal happiness, which is related to his own walk with God, uh, without, uh, regardless of what the congregation thinks of his teaching. And then there's the pastoral uh, form of happiness, where that's the joy related to the response of his congregation to his teaching. Personal happiness or joy for the believer is primarily, and we're talking about personal happiness here, is primarily based upon obedience to the Father's will, which is revealed by the Spirit through the teaching of the Word of God. So uh, it's one of the uh, manifestations of the Spirit in our lives, and that we're having fellowship is we're rejoicing. And when we're not having joy, and I'm not, I gotta say that, I gotta balance this. I'm not saying you could be like some of these churches where, you know, the charismatics, some of them, that they, you know, they think that, you know, laughing in the spirit, that's all garbage. It's not biblical. And then they just, you know, this, you know, oh, I'm having the joy of the Lord and they're always walking around with a smile on your face. Hey, you could be suffering with cancer and you're not going to be smiling, but you'll have a joy, rejoicing and contentment 
and that it's not that it's inward, even though you could be racked with pain from cancer. Okay, I've seen people like that. I've seen people who had a lot of suffering, but they had the joy of the Lord, and they were not. And you can always tell that they're not bitter people. They're not complaining all the time. They're not. Uh, they're not. Um, uh, finger pointing or uh, you know and blaming somebody for the way their life is a mess or that they have cancer or whatever it is they have a joy that's based upon walking with God so um, and, and I, this is very important because if, when we have this joy uh, what's going to happen is it, it's it, it's uh, it, it's attractive people want it people are unhappy around us sinners deceived by sin and Satan enslaved to sin and Satan and they don't have this joy they you, you're going to have a joy from things like marriage, there's a measure of joy there. Kids, um, making some money, going out, jumping out of airplanes, I don't know, going to a rock concert and, you know, playing music, playing, uh, listen, going to a concert. All those things can give us a measure of joy. But the problem with all those things is that it's only transitory and temporal, temporary. Because when, the, if you are, let's take for instance, you've heard me say this before, if you are, joy is based upon, let's say, circumstances. I'm making a lot of money, I'm married, I have kids, I got money in the, in, the, in the account, I live in a beautiful house, got a great job, got a great everything. And so once those things get taken away, you lose the job, you lose your health, your kids act crazy, and now all of a sudden, you're miserable. And now that's telling you something, God's trying to tell you something, that your joy is based upon those people or those things to keep you happy. But once they're taken away, where's the joy? You know, where is the joy now? It's gone. Because God wants us to deliver us from that. He doesn't want us to be, we call that being a slave to circumstances and people. Let's say, for instance, uh, I learned this a long time ago. Uh, but one of the big lessons I learned. Um, I learned, you know, there are people, let's say I had a, I told you I've had this, I had a boss. I worked for her, this woman. And it was in a bank. And she, she had it out for me, and for the longest, I, I would come home from work, and I was, like, upset. I was, like, really upset. It was, like, everything I do, she's just all over me for everything. No matter what, if I did something good, she'd find something bad. And she's just, like, after I said, like, am I wrong, God, or is this woman after me? So, you know, I've, now I was learning about, I was studying Philippians on my own, and Paul, that's a joy, an epistle about joy. And I real, realized that, you know, and I was taught this, is that, you know, you can't have your, ha you can't let people dictate your happiness. So I refused to let, I had to apply what I was being taught uh, in my personal study and it, when, under my pastor is that I'm not going to let this woman, my boss, make me miserable. Because if I do, what's going to happen is she's got control over me. Because then that's exactly what happens. Now I'm giving control of my life to this person. So as it turns out, when I finally end up leaving that company, she, on the day I left, she left, wrote me a letter apologizing, apologizing and basically confessing to the fact that she was doing these things to me. And I was like, I knew it all along. But I was happy she had the, the guts to do that. Most people wouldn't apologize. And so, she, so I gave her a lot of credit for that. And so, but the, the point I'm trying to say, say is that don't let people, you know, like and this happens with pastors as well. The congregation, you don't get a big crowd. Uh, your people, uh, people who do are there, they look like they could care less. They, they look like they want to go to the, you know, ice cream or something. They could, you know, and it's easy to get discouraged, and you have to fight that constantly, fight that thing. Where I'm not going to let people's response or lack thereof or indifference uh, dictate my happiness. I, and I, and if I do, I'm letting them and my circumstances dictate my happiness. See, God wants to deliver us all from that stuff. He wants us to find our true joy and happiness in our walk with him. And, you know, all the great saints had to learn this. Elijah had to learn this. Uh, there's, you know, he cried out to God, uh, there's no one in Israel that's faithful anymore. I'm the only guy left. And God says, yeah, there's 6,000 other people who are faithful to me. You're not the only guy in town. And so Elijah had to learn that. Great spiritual giant. It can happen to a believer in spiritual maturity that he gets, or he or she gets discouraged by bad circumstances and ill treatment from people. So if you want people, you know, if you let people, uh, what they do to you, or what you perceive bad things they do to you, if you want to let them have control of you, be unhappy. Because that's, that, and that's, that's how, 
You know, that's how it, you see this in relationships. I, you know, you see this with boyfriend and girlfriend. The guy or the girl could say something to the boyfriend or the husband or the wife, or the girlfriend, and knows how to push their buttons to get them unhappy. And why do they do that? Because it gives them, an, it's their sin nature. Basically, I got a little control over my wife or my girlfriend or my husband or my boyfriend that I can make them unhappy by some, just saying one word. Don't let people control your happiness. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Let, God, let your walk with God be your true source, source of joy. So when we have joy, personal joy, is a result of obeying what the Spirit's telling us in the Word of God. If you could, uh, hold your place and if, turn to Galatians chapter 5, please. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 13. Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, your sin nature. But through love, serve one another. I've taught this before. You really want to be happy? Serve other people. How is that? It's an, it, it seems like it's a, an oxymoron. You know, it's contradictory. No, think about this. When you, what, who are the most, look at history. I've studied, I'm a big buff historian buff. I've studied all history, ancient history, right up to the present, all the, all the things. And let me tell you something. What, what you learn is um, that, you know, when, when uh, the people, you look, see with Elvis Presley or the Beatles, you told me about, they're in the top of their game and they're miserable. They're not happy, okay? And what happens is the most miserable people, and this is King Solomon in Ecclesiastes. He's Ecclesiastes sometimes. The most miserable people are the, most, are the self-centered people. Most, and I'll tell you right now, it's not politically correct, but you go, I could get, you know, psychiatrists, it's like, you know, a, a psychologists, excuse me, and they could sit there and push things around with people. And try, but at the heart of the problem is we're sinners and we're se- therefore selfish and self-centered and we're all about ourselves. And the most miserable people, and I know because I have a sin nature too, and when I was a teenager, my mother wanted to cut me off to a psychologist. She couldn't wait. She couldn't believe it when I was dating a psychologist. She thought that was the greatest thing. I was finally going to get some help. It's like, because I was, a, they would have, I'll tell you right now, they would have diagnosed me as bipolar. They would have today. Thank God I didn't live back then because then I'd be in all kinds of drugs. You know what it had cleaned me up? And it took a while. And I'm not, I'm not healed by any imagination because I'm still a sinner is the word of God cleaned out all the garbage in my head. I stopped thinking stupid thoughts and stopped being so self-centered. Why do I say that? I started looking at trying to serve God and other people and I became happier. So if you want to, if you want, the secret to happiness is be about other people, not be about yourself, you know? Look what he says in verse 14. For the whole law can be summed up in a single commandment. Namely, you must love your neighbors yourself. However, if you continually bite and devour one another, beware that you're not consumed by one another. But I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit, and the Spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For these are in opposition to each other, so that you cannot do what you want. That's why you, you know that you should do something, and you don't do it. Because we all have a war going on in us. The flesh, the sin nature says, oppose God, and you're, you know the Spirit's saying, you obey God. So that's why you're not a schizo. If you're a Christian, you have this battle going on. We all do. And this is very important for parents to understand. Not only are you fighting sin, but your kids are fighting sin too. We're all battling it, and our only hope is to obey the Spirit. Look at verse 18. But if you're led by the Spirit, see, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, the sin nature, are obvious. Sexual immorality, these are all manifestations that you're living in your sin nature. Impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. I'm warning you, as I have warned you before, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, that which the Spirit produces. And how does he do that? When we obey what he's telling us in the Word of God. Is love, joy. See, it's the joy. It, that's the joy of the Lord. You want to have true joy and happiness? Obey what the Spirit's telling you in the Word of God. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Please go back to 1 John now. So that's a little bit about personal happiness. But in 1 John 1, 4, John's talking about his pastoral happiness. It says in 1 John 1, 4, my translation, thus we ourselves are now communicating and writing concerning each of these things in order to cause our joy to exist in a maximum state. So we have John's pastoral happiness, which was based upon the fact that his spiritual children were obeying his apostolic teaching, which resulted in these children experiencing fellowship with God. God. However, the failure of John's readers to obey his apostolic teaching would not destroy his own personal happiness, which he acquired by being obedient to the will of the Father, which is revealed by the Spirit and the Word of God. So what I will say this, we'll come wrap it up here. What I'll say this, if you're a pastor, somebody's listened, there are pastors that have listened and uh, do listen and hit our website and whatnot. If you are listening and you're a pastor, uh, a little bit of advice if you're a young pastor, you've, if you're an older pastor, I'm sure you know this, but maybe you don't. But the big thing as a pastor is just be, mind, be faithful. And you can't control how people respond. You just can't. Don't make yourself miserable worrying about that. Pray for your people, but give, it up to, give them up to God. You can only do so much. You study, you prepare yourself, know your subject, teach your congregation, be faithful teaching, exemplify it in your life. Pray for your congregation, and then you have to just give it up to God. It's just like having kids. You can only do so much, and eventually the kids have to make their own decisions. And the same thing with the congregation. Eventually, you can teach them all the sound doctrine in the world and be faithful for years, and eventually it's going to be up between them and God now. But you can't let their response or lack thereof or indifference or rejection altogether of your teaching control your happiness. Don't let it make you miserable. If they, if, they, if they don't respond or they're indifferent, just keep focusing on your, what you're supposed to be doing. Remain faithful and get your joy knowing that you're faithful and that God's going to reward you for your faithfulness and seize this. Okay? And every great, all the great prophets, Jeremiah uh, and the apostles led by Jesus and pastors throughout the centuries up to the present moment have, 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 have been, their teaching has been rejected but they continued on and remained faithful. Uh, the, uh, Jonathan Edwards was one of the great, um, many don't even know him, but he lived in the, what, 1700s, 1600s, and he's one of the great you know, Puritan teachers of America, and he was very famous, and mo most people don't know this, but he's, uh, he got, uh, there was a big church split, and he got bumped out of his, his pastorate. He was taken over for his father. There was a big rift over uh, uh, Lord's Supper. He didn't want to serve the communion elements to unbelievers and people in the congregation and like that, and they threw him out. And he ended up, you know, kind of like, uh, basically he didn't have a congregation. He ended up being, a, um, he did a lot of writing and stuff, but he never, I don't think he had a big like congregation like he did prior. And basically he, and then he, uh, just before, uh, before he died, a couple years before he died, he ended up being a, a president of a, the, a theological seminary, and then he died. And he had a couple of years in that. But he was rejected. You know, and he's revered today, but back then he wasn't revered. <laughs> so, uh, what we see here is you have to, as a pat John, his, his his personal happiness is was his walk with God, and then there was the pastoral happiness related to the response of the recipients of his teaching. If they obey it, it would give him great joy. If they reject it, it's he still had his personal happiness that he had with his walk with God. Now, it's interesting. First John will. Close with this. First John one four echoes uh, two passages which we've studied, uh, three passages which we've studied in the past. Uh, Second John chapter four and Second uh, John uh, verse four and twelve. Remember, there's only one chapter in Second John, and Third John four. So Second John four and twelve and Third John four, they basically echo First John one four. Uh, if you could go to Second John, you're right in First John. Look at 2 John verse 1. We'll close with these two passages, three passages. 2 John 1, 1. From the elder 
to, to, the, to an elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I alone, but also those who know the truth, because of the truth that resides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God, the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly because I have found some of your children living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded us. Uh, if I could, let me give you my translation of that verse. I was prompted to greatly rejoice because I found some of your children making it a habit of living by means of truth just as we received the command from the Father. Look at, uh, hop up to, let's see, uh, go to verse 12. Though I have many other things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I have hoped to come visit you and speak face to face so that our joy may be complete. My translation of that verse, even though I am able to communicate in writing many other subjects to each and every one of you, I by no means want to, to, want to do so with paper and ink, but rather I am absolutely certain and confidently expect to arrive in the presence of all of you, that is to speak face to face in order to cause our joy to exist in a maximum state. Look at 3 John now, and we'll close here with this passage. Look at verse 1. 3 John 1. From the elder to Gaius, my dear brother, whom I love in truth, dear friend, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, just as you were living according to the truth. See, he's happy because they're living according to the truth, his teaching. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are living according to the truth. And every pastor could say amen to that. My translation of that verse, verse 4, I never experienced a greater joy than this, namely that I regularly hear about my own spiritual children because they're making it their habit a living by means of the truth. And I'll tell you what, and we'll close with this, nothing crushes you more than a pastor, as a pastor, when you see people not living, Christians in your congregation, not living according to the truth and rejecting it. And again, uh, your happiness must be uh, based upon your walk with God. You can't be let uh, the congregation's response or lack thereof to your teaching dictate your happiness. And that's true for all of us. Um, we can't uh, control, uh, we can only control what we, our own decisions. And so we can't let people dictate our happiness to us. So we have a, the pastoral happiness, and then we have the personal happiness. And there in verse 1 John 1, 4, and those other passages, and 2 and 3 John, we have the, uh, the pastoral happiness of John being mentioned. And tomorrow, we begin the first major section of the epistle, which begins at 1 John 1, 5, and it ends at 1 John 2, 2, which talks about sin in relation to fellowship, how it adversely affects our fellowship with the Trinity. So we'll pick that up tomorrow evening in 1 John 1, 5. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name we pray.